name is Jeffrey Shanks. I'll be talking today about what do you guys need to know about patent law. Just a quick little bit about my background. I have a mechanical engineering undergrad and an electrical um, graduate degree from the University of Michigan. And I focus on the areas of um, anywhere from hardware to software. Um, so it kind of covers uh, clean tech work, some software work, and a decent amount of med tech work, and squarely um, digital health. Why do startups file patents? These are typically the answers that you would give um, if you've studied something about patent law or you studied something about uh, large companies. Um, force it against a competitor, prevent the patenting by someone else, and generate some licensing revenue. And these are all terrible answers for startups. To enforce a patent against a competitor takes a significant amount of money, a significant amount of time, a significant amount of resources. Um, this is something that startups just can't afford. Um, somewhere on the order of three to five million to bring a lawsuit. It's about three to five million to defend a lawsuit. This is, in many ways, the sport of kings. And so when you see Samsung and Apple dueling it out, like, they can afford to do this. You can't. The chance is that you're actually going to enforce one of your patents pretty much nil. Um, it takes a really long time, and it costs as much money. So this isn't why you're doing it. To prevent the patenting by someone else. Um, this isn't actually the easiest way or the cheapest way to do this. Um, to prevent someone from patenting something, you could simply just publish it and make sure that the patent office knows about it. Um, this could be as simple as writing a white paper and um, publishing it in certain journals that the patent office definitely reads and make sure that they could actually search this and index it and make sure that it comes up in their particular searches of your competitor patent applications. There's a change in the patent law that's going through right now that's going to make it a lot easier uh, for you to be able to submit prior art that you know to your competitors' patent applications that are going through the patent office. And so the concept of patenting something just so someone else could, doesn't have the ability to patent it isn't the smartest idea. Generate licensing revenue is, is one of the other ideas of why you would patent something. This is also fairly um, a terrible idea from a startup standpoint. It takes an enormous amount of effort um, to get into a company, to be able to pitch them your, your idea, to be able to show that you have a, a market there, to show that you actually have a prototype that's going to work. It's actually easier just to build a company. And so the concept that you're going like, to license something, maybe that is um, what you're doing as a company, uh, but if you were a solo inventor just running around hoping to license your technology, that doesn't exist anymore. There are 3,000 patents that issue every single Tuesday. Companies just don't have the bandwidth to take, you know, to um, research and to know about every single one of those patents that are coming down. They simply don't care about licensing in your particular technology. Your company, they might be interested in acquiring you. They might be interested in your talent, the user base that you already have, all of the other things that you're building. But that IP is probably somewhere on the order of number three, number four, or number five on that list. It's not number one. It's not off the list, but it's not the most important thing that you're doing. That's why to start smart startups actually uh, file patents. A couple different reasons. Um, the one that um, will kind of go up in, in order from uh, three down to, down to one. To increase the leverage of, over a partner. Oftentimes, we'll file patent applications for our clients right before they get into a joint venture. Um, say you're getting into bed with this you know, huge global company, and you're starting into this joint venture in a couple of weeks. You're going to be transferring knowledge to them. And at some point, they're going to think that that knowledge was theirs, that they always had that. To be able to file provisional applications before that joint venture starts is incredibly important for you to be able later on to say, this is our IP. And as we're building all these other things with this joint venture on top of this IP, and you're going to need us, and you're going to need our IP to be able to move forward. We've done this a couple of times where we filed, you know, in a short burst of time, you know, on the order of three, four, five, and one time it was actually eight, um, right before one of our clients um, joined, uh, had a joint venture with Philips. And that actually reserved them a seat later on at the table. Um, when this particular technology was spinning out, um, they were able to take and, and negotiate successfully a good chunk of that spin out because they, were, they had the IP and they were able to show that this isn't going to move forward without our IP. Had we not filed that right beforehand, I could assure you that it would have gone that same direction, that 
some of the other things that we didn't file um, was turned on that it looked like they had actually um, filed it later on, filed for IP on that stuff later on. And so being able to increase your leverage while you're a smart, small startup, be able to say, well, we have filed some patents on this. This is why you need us. It's an incredibly nice reminder to a large company. They have a lot to lose. If you sue them later on, like that's something that they're hoping to make a ton of money off of this. And if you sue them for 5% of that or 10% of that, that's a good chunk of change. And they're going to go ahead and pay attention to you and listen to you and have, allow you a seat at that table later on. One of my favorite reasons for um, startups to file a patent application is to deter an infringement lawsuit. This happens silently. We don't really know that this happens. But we know that when our clients are still around, two or three years after they're starting to bite into the um, revenue, bite into the profit of one of their major competitors, and that major competitor has a patent that they infringe, that why is that still happening? Why are they still allowed to do that? And we could look back and say, oh, it's because of the portfolio that we built. And because of these things that we filed that our competitor ended up copying, but we could turn around later on and say they didn't sue us on those fundamental ideas because we protected some of the improvements. We protected some of these smaller features that built on top of this um, foundational IP. And so we were able to protect and keep some of our clients alive. And this is huge. Again, it happens silently because we don't really know that, oh, this company didn't bring a lawsuit because of this particular reason. But we know that these, our clients are still existing, even though that they're infringing other patents. The number one reason, however, though, is to, to stimulate some kind of an acquisition or to increase your evaluation. Investors like to see this. It's fairly well established over the last year that an issued patent is worth about a million, million and a half. You can see the Google deal, the Nortel deal, the Kodak deal, the Apple, Microsoft, all of these deals are, fairly, are establishing um, the value of a patent, an issued patent, at about a million, million and a half. If you put thirty to forty thousand dollars in, and you get a million, million and a half out, this is the type of investment that an investor wants to see. It's a huge return on investment. This doesn't say this isn't trying to imply that you should just take fifty percent of the money that you raise and turn it into patent applications. These have to be issued patents later on to be able to have that kind of value. But investors understand that you could significantly increase the value of that company later on if you're actually protecting your IP. The problem with some of the things of a startup is that you don't necessarily have the money to protect it, and then later on you can't because it's too late. We'll talk about that um, during the next hour. When do I have to file a patent? This is the law, and the law is not quite engineering, so it's not black and white. But we're talking about um, a printed publication or public use or on sale. The grayish, the most gray thing of these, of these three concepts is public use. Well, if I have a beta that has 50 people in that beta, is that public use? I've shared it with a couple of my close friends. Is that public use? I've talked to a bunch of investors in an open setting you know, at Demo Day. Is that a public disclosure? All of these things are shades of gray, and so lawyers can argue them both ways. But I'd say that if there's some kind of strong expectation that the, your audience is not going to disclose that information, then that's probably not a public disclosure. But if there's no expectation that they could turn around and just go ahead and tell someone else, then that is a public disclosure. That's one factor out of about 12. But that seems to be one that uh, startups seem to resonate well with. They understand that. So is a beta 50, is that a public disclosure? Well, if these are close friends of yours, or maybe they signed a non-disclosure, or they clicked through a non-disclosure, then that would indicate that this could be actually still closed. These are friends of friends, and now it's kind of getting out of control, and you don't actually get any feedback from those folks. That looks a heck of a lot more like a public disclosure. In the United States, we still have a year, which is great. So you could go ahead and publicly disclose, and you could wait to file that patent application within the next 12 months. The problem is, in the rest of the world, there isn't uh, this grace period. That you need to file a patent application before that public disclosure. So this is what you could do in the United States. 
But if you want to protect abroad, you're going to need to file some kind of provisional application. Provisional applications are kind of how they sound. Like, they're easier, they're cheaper, and they only last a certain period of time. They last exactly 12 months. Not 12 months in a day, um, exactly 12 months. And if you file a full application within that 12 months, the Patent Office pretends like you filed that full application on the date of the provisional. It's not going to necessarily affect you guys right here, um, but it will definitely affect the, every startup here. We're moving to a first-to-file system. March of 2013, it's going to be whoever gets to the Patent Office first wins. Right now, we have a first-to-invent system. It's unlike anything else. Everyone else is on a first-to-file system. So we're moving in the direction of harmonizing with the rest of the world. But if you have, in a first-to-invent system, as long as you have good documentation in your lab notebooks, and you were working on this diligently over a certain period of time, then you could later on say, this is when I conceived it. This is when I invented it. And we successfully argued with the Patent Office several times to be able to say, hey, look, this isn't prior art. Even though this was filed before we filed our patent application, but we actually invented it earlier, and here's proof. When we move to a first-to-file system, then it's going to be whoever files first. And we're going to be filing many more provisional applications. And you're probably going to get in the habit of actually filing earlier and often. Because you don't necessarily know what is going to be the great idea. Your company is going to pivot a couple of times. You're going to try to figure this thing out over a period of a year. That's great. That's exactly what a provisional application gives you. It's a full year. And so I can imagine, in, like right now, my clients don't file or don't convert every single one of those provisionals to a full application. They allow some of those to actually go abandoned. But I can imagine a time a year from now where this is actually maybe half or maybe even a third of the provisional applications get converted because you're trying to actually just kind of hedge your bets as to what of these technologies is going to be um, the winner. A lot of folks have in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, have said that this is a terrible law for startups. This is a ter law, terrible law for inventors. And I actually think quite the opposite. I was at a big firm for a good portion of my career, and we had big uh, Fortune 500 clients, Fortune 10 clients. And I understand like, what it takes to get a patent application through the system in a large company. And it takes about nine months. You've got to convince the inventor to actually fill out a form. And that takes a little while. And he gets bugged by his manager to actually finally do it. And then that particular form gets put in a queue, and then some invention committee looks at it. And then that gets into a queue, if it's a good idea, and another invention committee looks at that. And then turn around and then give it to an outside patent council, which sits on it for a couple of months. And then they turn around and give it back. And then the inventor eventually gets to it two or three months after that. And then they turn around and file it. And another different lecture that could come back and teach you guys how to file your own provisional. It's not that hard. And so you guys could have an invention in the morning, during a morning run or morning shower, and actually file a provisional application that day. And there's no big company that could beat that. And so if you guys understand the concept of first to file, and understand the concept of writing your own provisional applications, like you're going to beat them every single time. Next biggest question, okay, so now we know when, um, but what is actually patentable? You guys will run into a bunch of different things here in terms of some of you guys will be making some hardware. Um, that's clearly the subject matter of uh, patents. Uh, maybe it's actually like how you use this other person's piece of hardware, um, and you guys are doing it very differently. Uh, maybe it's the way that you make it, uh, or maybe there's just some software, some algorithms that run on top of it. Maybe there's a communication platform. All of those things are patentable subject matter. People don't quite understand like, how software and patents work. I don't actually really see a distinction between software and hardware. An invention is an idea that no one's ever done before. Let's do these things in a row. Let's connect these different pieces. Let's connect these gears and lever. Let's connect this particular algorithm with this particular input and output it in this particular way. The fact that it's um, embodied in software is just one is our medium to actually deliver it. It could be embodied in firmware, hardware, gears and levers. I mean, the software that we do is actually just a way of doing ones and zeros. And we could actually take any single invention that you have and just make gears and levers. It might take a significant 
gear and lever building to do that, but we could do that. The first computers, the first software was all in mechanical. And so when people talk about, well, why is software patentable, or I thought software wasn't patentable, like, to me that just doesn't really even make sense. It's just a way to capture an idea. And so a decent number of you will be having software inventions. And that's just a way of capturing, hey, this is a great idea. No one else has ever taken these two pieces of information before, filtered them like this, processed like this, and used it in this particular way. I often think of software inventions as just a flowchart or a block diagram of maybe six, maybe eight blocks. And around that number of blocks and different connections, you might be able to describe something that's never been done before. And if that's the case, then that could be patentable. One way to think about um, inventions and products and concepts is kind of this concept of an, an abstraction layers. Here's this big, big idea. You know, we are going to solve diabetes. And we may be solving diabetes by connecting people together and making sure that they run through this particular protocol and share particular concepts and share their experiences. The actual specific product might be 100,000 lines of code, a couple million lines of code. But this, those lines of code are still describing this general concept of sharing um, or a group together, a group of people that are together on a, on a social network that are all, each of them running through a particular protocol of prediabetes. The specific product, the 10 million lines of code, that's probably patentable. No one's ever put those 10 millions of lines of code together exactly like that. But it wouldn't be valuable because you change a couple lines of code and then you get around that patent. And the very bottom concept, you know, the big, big concept, we are solving uh, the prediabetes problem by using a social network. It's too big of a concept. Someone has kind of thought of that before. It's obvious. That's not patentable. And so along the same spectrum, I'm describing the same thing with a couple words, with 10 million lines of code. The 10 million lines of code version of this isn't valuable. The 20 word version of this isn't patentable. What you actually see is somewhere in the middle, the 100, 150, 200, 250 word version of this. And that's actually where the invention is. When you start describing it in terms of, we're making these particular connections, we're running through these five or six different steps. Now I could describe this particular invention, but that's a client that's actually run through this um, Rock Health before. Um, and that could be actually a patentable invention. The 200 word version. And so when people talk about, well that's just a big concept, that's not patentable. Um, one click. That's too big of a concept. Everyone has clicked their mouse button once before. And so when people talk about how could one click possibly be patented, um, when you actually look at the lines of code that Amazon uses to run the one click purchase program, like thousands, millions of lines of code, it's the same thing. But if you look at the 200 word version of that, that's the patent that they got. And no one has ever done that particular version before. No one's done that abstraction layer. So this is when I talk about just kind of moving through the abstraction layers of an invention or a product or a general concept, this is what I mean by that. And I think that this is actually a pretty huge insight into what could possibly be patentable. But when you start thinking about your invention, when you start thinking about your product, when you start thinking about your big, huge concept, try to put it in a paragraph form. And has anyone ever done that paragraph before? And is, would this be valuable to protect? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, then that's an awesome space to start thinking about in terms of a patent. The biggest misunderstanding about patent law is that there's actually some kind of relationship between the patentability of an invention and whether or not that particular product is actually going to infringe someone else's patent. It's one of my favorite examples. So we have here on the left Edison's light bulb. Edison, one of America's greatest inventors, um, the electric lamp one of the greatest inventions of all, of all time. On the right we have something um, that was an improvement upon uh, the electric light bulb. 
Pipkin, who you may or may not have heard of, um, came up with the concept of making a frosted light bulb. Every single light bulb in this room is frosted. It was kind of a big deal. Pipkin got a patent on it. There's a patent on the light bulb, and there's a patent on the frosted light bulb. Who can actually make a frosted light bulb? How about Edison? Can Edison make a frosted light bulb? Yeah, I mean, he patented the light bulb. Of course he can, right? How about Pipkin? Can Pipkin make a frosted light bulb? Yeah, I mean, he patented it, right? He should be able to make a frosted light bulb. Yeah, yes, we actually got a right answer in the back. So the biggest misunderstanding of patent law is this concept that these two things are actually related. Whether or not you could get a patent and whether or not you could actually move forward and make this thing without infringing someone else's patent. I like to kind of show it with kind of these circles and kind of building upon each other. So Edison's in light bulb, foundational idea, huge, broad in scope. Light bulb. It didn't say like it had to be square or round or light bulb shaped. It didn't say that it had to be glass or frosted or not or, or red. It didn't necessarily talk about exactly the filament, although it does talk about quite a few different filaments that it could be. It was broad. It was huge. It was the light bulb. The frosted light bulb was a specific version of that. It was an improvement of that. And it kind of sits on top of it. It was a big idea in the sense that it was pretty important. Every single one of these light bulbs. We're going to give Pipkin a patent on this. The way that it disperses light, the way that it doesn't hurt your eyes when you actually stare at um, the, the filament, the way that it gives a nice warm glow, it kind of looks a little bit like the sun. This is something that we all like and we use all the time. Every single one of the light bulbs in this room is frosted. When we look at this from the top down, we see Edison's black fence and we see Pipkin's red fence. And Pipkin's red fence is inside of Edison's black fence. And if we want to make a frosted light bulb, we need to be sitting inside or standing inside of the red fence. Now, Edison has a black key. So he could get into the black fence. But he's going to run into the red fence. And Pipkin has the key. Pipkin, on the other hand, has got the key to the red fence, but he can't even get inside that circle because Edison has got the key for the black fence. They could swap keys. They could say, look, um, every single time you make a light bulb, throw me 50 cents, and we'll call it even. That's a license. Turn around and you could say, um, to, you know, from Pipkin to Edison, I think there's this huge deal out there. It's called the frosted light bulb. Uh, I don't know how to make these things. Um, I don't know how to distribute them. You got this thing pretty much locked up um, and it's kind of game over. But every single time you make one of these frosted light bulbs, why don't you give me a quarter? And so Pipkin might just be able to sit back and say, yeah, this is awesome. Look at all these frosted light bulbs that Edison is selling for me. And Edison might be saying this is great because we now have a $2 markup on every single one of these frosted light bulbs. We're making a ton of money. So we give a little bit to Pipkin, who cares? There might be a third party involved. Let's say Westinghouse gets involved and says, you know what, we're going to give Edison 75 cents every single time we make a light bulb, and we're going to give Pipkin 25 cents every single time we make this frosted light bulb. And so they're giving a bunch of money away, but now they're the, you know, they might be the only ones if they got an exclusive license, but they could go ahead and say, all right, we both have a license for this technology. They might be a complete stalemate. How many patents do you think are on this thing? It's only a 3GS, and so it's definitely a little bit older. It doesn't in include all the fancy new technology. Um, but how many patents? Is there one on this? At, at least once, right? Is there at least 10? There was 200. 200? At launch. First Probably about 5,000. Oh. I have only five of them. You only have five. OK, so a small percentage. Yeah. But that's still very impressive. <laughs> we know it's more than five. It's been estimated that there's about 5,000 patents on all the different technologies that go into this. How is that possible? How, I mean, how does this exist if there's 5,000 patents that, that cover this? Apple doesn't own all 5,000 of those. 
So how does this exist? Yeah, this is the same thing as a frosted light bulb. There's cross-licensing that's happening right now between Apple and Samsung when they're not fighting each other, and between Apple and Intel and Apple and Qualcomm and Apple and a bunch of other companies. And there's a bunch of fights that they haven't settled yet. And there's a bunch of fights that they don't even know about yet. There's about 5,000 patents in that. The concept of cross-licensing is how it like, solves this particular issue. The biggest thing that I want you to understand is that you're not carving out your own unique space when you get a patent. You're not going to be able to say, if I stay within this space, then I'm OK. And you're not because of this over here. You're on top of someone else, or you could be on top of someone else. So if I was an investor, no, if I was Pipkin, and you're an investor, and I come to you, and I say, look, frosted light bulb, huge idea. Everyone's going to have it. You know, 99% of light bulbs in the future, they're all going to be frosted light bulbs. I got a patent on it. Would you invest in my company? Yeah. Right. It's a little bit more complicated. I heard no, yes, and then it depends. Like, you want to know more. This is exactly the questions that your investors are going to ask. Great, so you filed a provisional application, and your patent attorney thinks that this is patentable. Terrific. Good for you. But are you actually infringing someone else's patent? There's two questions here. They want to make sure that you're actually protecting your idea because they want to make sure that no one else is just going to be able to jump in and do this. If you're plowing a path and you're getting all these people excited about it and then someone else could just go ahead and say, great, I'll take it from here, like your investors are going to be ticked off. They don't want that to happen. They want you to be able to say, we, you want to, they want you to be able to say, we got this thing locked up. No one's going to be able to copy us. No one's going to be able to make small changes and get away with it. Someday this patent's going to grow up and it's going to be strong and it's going to be valuable someday. But they also want to know that are you infringing someone else's patent? Is there a pioneer out there? Is there an Edison out there that you're stepping into to be able to even get to your space? This question's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit tricky to answer. How many patents are there out there? We just flipped over the 8 million mark the other day, a couple months ago. So there's only 8 million patents out there that you have to look at. I already mentioned that there are 3,000 that issue every single Tuesday. So how much do you think you'd have to pay me so that I would give a written guarantee that you don't infringe any patents? Let's take a wild number. How much would it be? You couldn't pay me enough. Like literally. Like I couldn't pull together the team to be able to search all 8 million patents, to be able to understand exactly the 3,000 patents that are going to issue next Tuesday, and the Tuesday after that, and the Tuesday after that, to be able to keep track of you to make sure that every single one of your pivots, you're not going to infringe. And so the concept of a lot of engineers is like, I want to make sure that I understand the landscape perfectly. And you can't. And you have to give up that. But there's a fear that your investors are going to have. And that fear is that one of the major competitors in this space is going to shut you down. It's not that there's going to be some crazy guy out there, you know, in some other state, you know, far away, that's going to come knocking on the door. Because that guy you just pay off. You give him $50,000, you give him $100,000, you give him 1% of your company, whatever it is, like, you're not going to be shut down. You're going to still be able to move forward. Are you going to be able to license the technology of your major competitor? When they come knocking and say, hey, you infringe our technology, are you going to be able to say, oh, you're right, um, but we're willing to pay you for it? Do you think that's going to be able to, that conversation's going to go well? No, there's no way. They want you dead. They don't want you around. They don't want you to pay them a little bit. They want you gone. And so the biggest fear that your investors have isn't the fact that one of those 8 million patents is going to kill you, is that one of those 80 patents, one of your competitors, that they're going to be ticked off and sue you. And so you don't have to look. The whole key to this is that you don't have to look at all 8 million. And in fact, if you do, you're going to find something that's scary. And if you find something that's scary a little bit too early, then you're going to scare off all your investors and everything's not going to go well for you. 
But if you look at just your competitors and you focus on their portfolio, the small little segment of that 8 million patents out there, you could tell your investors with a decent amount of confidence, yeah, we looked at the portfolio of these three companies that we listed on slide four as our major competitors, and we don't infringe any of their patents. What else are you worried about? Everything else we could handle. And so this concept of freedom to operate, a lot of investors get confused by it, but really what they are super scared about, and they won't articulate this very well, is that they're scared that a major competitor is going to put you out of business. Not that there's a patent out there. There is always a patent out there. There are 8 million patents out there. There's always a patent out there that's close and it's going to keep you up at night eventually. I've represented 250 startup clients and every single one of them has had one patent that's kept them up. Is this person ever going to sue us? We looks like we infringe them. It's out there. There are a couple patents right now, whatever idea you have, that are going to be a stumbling block. The key is to make sure that none of your competitors have one of those patents and to convince your investor of that, that everything is going to be fine and you're going to be able to deal with a wider scope of patents later on. In the beginning, maybe you're only looking at 80. When you're raising a Series A, maybe you look at 800. When you're looking at raising a Series B, maybe you're looking at 8,000 patents. You might not ever look at all 8 million, but this thing scales. And a lot of patent attorneys don't really understand this concept of scaling this because they don't really fully grasp what the investor is truly, truly concerned about. And at the early stage, all they're concerned about is your major competitor. I told you a little bit about my background, both mechanical and electrical, and I do a significant amount of software. Um, when folks come to me and they have a, a great biochem or a, a pharmaceutical idea, I turn them down. Like they might say, like, look, this is the greatest invention. We want you to work on this. And I say, I can't do it. I'm not a good fit for you. You want to have a patent attorney that's actually going to be able to brainstorm in the particular area that you're in. You're going to come to your patent attorney with a single idea saying, hey, look, we want you to patent this. But your patent attorney needs to be able to go through those abstraction layers of that pyramid to be able to say, this is a specific product, but there's a bigger invention here. And we want to be able to protect that bigger invention so that you have something a little bit more valuable. So one of the key things to, to look at when you're looking for a patent attorney is actually that they're in their technical background. The weird thing is, is they can't be a perfect fit for you. If you say, do you have this exact technological background? If they say yes, they probably can't be your patent attorney. Because it'd be a conflict of interest because they've already represented a client in that exact issue or is that exact area. So you're looking for something that's complementary to what you've done in the past. Patents are tough. The Supreme Court has said it is the hardest legal document there is, period. You want to have someone that's actually done, has written quite a few patent applications. When you work at a lot of big firms, one of the things that's um, very, very common is that you go in the door working with a very senior attorney, and then you're thrown on, you know, with this younger associate that's now working on patent application number three. And this is fairly common. And so as an early stage startup, you want to be fighting for like, someone who's actually fairly experienced to be able to make sure that they're the ones that are actually doing your work, or at least drafting the claims making sure that the claims, which are the most important part, are going to be solidified by someone with a significant amount of experience. The last one, though, is I actually think one of the most important, which is the business. Do they actually understand like, who you are and what you're trying to do? Do they understand that you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to raise money? Do they understand that what you need right now is a small amount? Maybe it's a provisional application and a really early preliminary freedom to operate. And that might be enough to be able to get through your seed round. And that might be all you could afford. And then during, after you raise the seed round, maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe you file a couple more provisionals. Maybe you file another patent application or two. Maybe you do a little bit more comprehensive freedom to operate. And then when you raise a B round, it's a little bit more. This thing needs to scale. At some point, you want to have this perfect, beautiful patent portfolio. But in the beginning, you can't afford it. I've had quite a few clients that have transferred their, their work from a larger firm to us. And the biggest thing that went wrong is that they filed too many things too early. Eight PCT applications before they closed their seed round. This looks impressive for an investor, but it's also incredibly expensive. On the order of about a quarter million dollars after about a year and a half. And if you haven't raised enough money, 
then you're abandoning all of those PCT applications. A PCT application is a worldwide patent application. You're trying to reserve your, your right to be able to protect your invention in a couple of different countries, any country. Now you've taught the world how to make your invention, and you abandon that. This is pretty disastrous from both a cash flow and a technology um, proprietary ship like type of manner. And so being able to scale your portfolio is incredibly important. So make sure that your patent attorney has that kind of background to be able to, that they work with startups all the time.